In filmmaking, does high budget mean high quality? Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness is a fantastic film, but this multiverse film did it better and cheaper. How did I end up being stuck to Marvel movies? But this movie is so refreshing and I didn't know how much I missed this. Which made us think, in order to be good storytellers, we have to rediscover great stories. The best storytelling always asks an interesting question that goes to the core of humanity. But those stories are told in cinema and our frustration is that audiences don't watch YouTube in the same way. But whose fault is that? YouTube doesn't have the reputation of every single thing that you click on is super high quality content that because has been made. Because everyone can post on YouTube. Because everyone can post on YouTube. Which raises the question, is it possible to take YouTube as seriously as cinema? I actually want to talk about an insecurity of mine. Welcome back to the editing podcast, guys. This is a podcast where we talk about editing, talk about movies, talk about YouTube, talk about cinema, talk about a little bit of everything. If something's being edited, we're going to talk about it. Oh, yeah and freaking lots of stuff gets edited. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I have been relatively complacent with what movies have been released the past couple of years. Yeah. A Marvel movie, great, I'll go to the cinema. Big, stupid Hollywood action movie, great, I'll go see that one. And I have ended up, without realizing for the past eight years, not watching independent indie films. Limited release films, movies that don't have the big, huge marketing campaign. And because they don't do the big, huge marketing campaign, I choose to ignore them. People started talking about this movie a lot. Yeah. People were saying, go see this movie. I kept seeing blog posts of, of like, everything ever all at once is being uh, extended cinema release for another three months. And I'm like, wait, maybe I should go see this film. And I did. And I got to say, it was like a transcendent experience. Facts. That's exactly the way that I would describe it too. It was so oddly spiritual. Yeah. I think for me, refreshing. Yeah. This is a multiverse movie for the most ridiculous reasons and found really creative ways to motivate the reason to cut to the next multiverse. Mm -hmm. So for example, the scene, my favorite scene for all this is when, when they're locked into that cupboard and everyone throws in like these gas is gonna knock him out. And student has to go through multiple different universes to then help get the skills for her to escape and beat everyone in that room. And it is just genius. And the fact that uh, we cut between how she gets her skills. So she gets the riot shield. Yep. And then we cut to her just like throwing around that, that board that, on, on a corner street. And then we cut to her doing the exact same movement with a riot shield. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, this is filmmaking. Yeah. This is filmmaking. Imagine if they did that on Doctor Strange. They did, they, they kind of did that on Doctor Strange, but just not as well. Yeah. But this movie for me was just a, oh my God, this is so refreshing and a unique experience. And I didn't know how much I missed this. I didn't even have words to describe that movie, bro. I was in a daze after watching yes, it. Yes, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know, I was just sitting in my bed by myself, just staring at the ceiling, like wondering about life. <laughs> I think the thing for me that was so refreshing was how deep it impacted my soul, honestly. Mm. Or even just how it asked questions that are questions that really actually matter. So I have IMDb and I rate movies on it, oh, okay. essentially. And I gave this movie a 10 out of yes. 10. 10 out of 10. I have like three movies that are 10 out of 10. And this is now and one this of is them. now one of them. So this, this is like a top three movie for me. This is, and it's yeah. because of the questions that it asked and the themes that it had more so than, you know, anything else. I haven't seen the Doctor Strange movie, mm -hmm. but, you know, Marvel movies, the thing that they're trying to solve is how do we save the world from blowing up? How do we save as many people as possible? And mm -hmm. this one, they had the whole thing with, you know, the world's going to end. Oh, no. But it was actually about but family. it was actually about family. It was, about it was family. actually about a mother and daughter relationship. This was a Fast and Furious movie, but good. Yeah, you know, it exactly. Like it actually, actually explored the deep themes about family. And yeah. Well, because to an extent, I like that because when a family starts to fall apart, to an extent, it feels like your whole world's ending anyway. It felt like the whole world is ending, but bottom line, it was actually about a mother and a daughter uh, fixing their relationship, yeah. but with this multiversal collapse. Yeah. And I think... What it was is something that I talk about a lot with a lot of the creators that I work with when they like to go for the, the big spectacle ideas, but they don't give enough uh, emotional motivation as to yep. why. Yep. This movie is a really, really good example of that. It is a big spectacle, a big multiversal war, and everyone is coming to kill each other. Yep. But at the root of it, it is about a mother apologizing to their daughter and saying, I'm sorry, 
and I understand you. And that's, the, that's it. That's the actual movie. And to an extent, the spectacle is relatively irrelevant because we don't care about the spectacle anymore because we're actually now invested in the emotional story. Mm -hmm. But it used the spectacle to then motivate what happens next in the emotional story. I think the questions that it raised to I really love philosophical movies. Yep. So it just tickled all of my favorite parts of my brain. Why are we here? Why does anything matter? What's the point of everything? And that is what like drew me in, I think. Mm. That's what really sucked me in. Cause I was like, okay, we're asking a question that everyone has thought of. And I think the ability that the movie had to get inside of people's brains into their most private thoughts mm -hmm. and explore them and say, hey, this is what, this is what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. I think that was phenomenal. It's deep, it's personal, it's existential. I think that's probably the best form of writing if you can make me feel existential. Yep. You walk out of the movie and thinking like, I don't believe in any of this anymore. And yeah. I think that to an extent it did that. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to be thinking about that movie for months and that's how you know it's a good movie. But one of the things that I keep coming back and I'm grateful for this movie is coming back to the fact that I had a complacency with big blockbuster movies. Uh -huh. And this movie refreshed or cleansed my palate onto better movies. Or not better movies, I would say Movies that are not just uh, big blockbuster Hollywood. I've now gone into what other weird indie movies. Now, granted, uh, the production company A24 is pretty much at the Hollywood state. Yeah. But they push towards that indie movie direction and that refreshing palette direction. And so now I'm going into what other, what other interesting movies can I then look into? And the one I did watch was Swiss Army Man. Have you seen that uh, one? I haven't seen that one, no. I was always confused about this movie or apprehensive about watching this movie because the pitch was, uh, it's an hour and a half movie of Daniel Radcliffe farting. <laughs> As a corpse, by the yeah. way. Yeah. And so I wasn't <laughs> sure about the movie. That movie felt a bit too <laughs> weird for me. Yeah. And so I chose to neglect it. And then I watched Marvel movies for like for the next 10 years or so. But now I watched that movie again, what for the first time, and again, it was almost as good as everything ever at once. It was a genuinely fantastic, beautifully well-made movie that had subtle themes that didn't just throw in your face and then opened it up to interpretation. Yeah. And thought-provoking is the bottom line phrase that I can say for this. I like what's going on here and it's making me feel things <laughs> in the most simple way of putting it. Yeah. And I'm trying to understand how I feel about this experience. Yeah. And so I think my interpretation of it is a character, the main character having a mental health issue and uh, choosing to ignore it. But then at the end of the movie, actually coming to terms with it and then yeah. giving him a platform and potential opportunity in working towards bettering his mental health. Yeah. And they did it with him surfing on a corpse of Daniel Radcliffe farting across the ocean. <laughs> that is so good. Has there ever been a movie, except for everything ever all at once, that's probably been the most thought-provoking movie for you that sticks to you, has, has a really interesting emotional core, really great subtextual story that makes you probably have a own unique interpretation of it? The movie that I'm going to pick that's a little bit weird is Annihilation. The thing that, that really drew me to it was the sound design mm. in it and the soundtrack. It was just, there was so many synthesizers and drones and everything was very out of this world. Mm. And it just was haunting but beautiful at the same time, which is really what captured that area. How did that movie make you feel? What, or what did that movie make you think? Again, this movie is like very philosophical yeah. in the ending. All it is is it's an alien invasion mm -hmm. and it's an alien taking over. Mm -hmm. But this alien is formless when it lands and then it turns and morphs into whatever life form is there. Mm. So that's the easiest way to say it. it's just a thriller um, sci-fi of an alien taking over the world. But I just remember I went to the cinema like three days in a row and watched it three times oh, in wow. a row. Like it was, it was one of those experiences. And everything everywhere all, all at once made me feel the exact same way. It's Except what, even to a higher degree, which is why it gets a higher rating. I think I watched Annihilation once on Netflix. I'm trying to remember how it made me feel. And I, think, I remember some of the thing. There's an existentialness to it. There's an element of horror towards it. There's an yep. element of peace. Yep. Like I remember some of the characters' uh, deaths were like, a choice or like yeah. an element of peace, but yeah. then also some of them were violent. Yeah. And so maybe part of it was like embracing death yep. or embracing change as well. Yep. And I think also processing that change. I think uh, yeah. it was Natalie Portman, she was the main character, wasn't she? Yeah. I think part of it was her confronting change or confronting herself because I think the alien started mimicking her. Yep. But I think again- That's what, what it was. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I but I think it's, it's another one of those interpretational movies. And I think intentional, I think I like to rate movies by how long they stay with me afterwards. And I think that's probably what's actually standing out to be different from these movies. Uh -huh. When I watch a Marvel movie, I'm entertained. 
Yeah. I watched the the new the latest Thor Love and Thunder movie two days ago, and I've already forgotten I watched it. But yeah. I was entertained at the time. Yeah. But these movies are staying with me. They're giving yeah. me memories. They're giving me emotional experiences. They're making me change my outlook on life a little bit. It's making me challenge my beliefs and making me challenge how I feel about things. Uh, Swiss Army Man challenged and embraced mental health. I suffer from mental health issues as well. And so that gave me a bit of uh, melancholy contemplation and peace with my mental health issues as well. When you yeah. choose to embrace and accept what you can do with that moving forward. Yeah. Annihilation is existential or reflection of yourself. It's your potentially ignoring a flaw of your character or your personality. And this alien comes along and challenges you by mimicking it. And then like, you have to potentially choose to destroy it. Yep. And then that's what that movie is about. Yep. Oh my God, why <laughs> if I... How did I end up being stuck to Marvel movies when all these movies are giving me so much better experiences? Yeah. And that was what made me fall in love with movies to begin with. I forgot this. And it's like, I've been reactivated now. This is what it's meant to be about. Yeah. Make me feel something. Don't just entertain me, make me care. Yeah. They always ask a question. Yeah. And it's a question that matters to you. And it's a question that you will think about for weeks, months on end. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think the best storytelling always asks an interesting question that goes to the core of humanity and yeah. who we are. Do you think we need to start watching more of these movies? Dude, absolutely. <laughs> I have a problem. I need to get back into it. Yeah. I've called you out on this before where I think us as editors, like I think you you have stopped watching movies. Yeah. I've only stopped to watching Marvel movies. People like to make fun of film students only watching A24 movies. Yep. I think it's our time. It's our time in our late 20s to finally go down the A24 wave. That was my norm. And then when it came to like working every single day, editing, watching stuff for, you know, eight to 12 hours a day, mm. once you're done with that, you just want to get away from it. The you last wanna, thing you want to do is watch a movie. The last thing you want to do is watch a movie. Mm. And in film school, it was fun because I could talk about it with all my friends in my classes and, you know, just nerd out about it. But if I'm not surrounded by people like you, mm. some film buffs, I just, I don't know, I start to lose interest in it. But I think it's so important to stay inspired and to have that, those movies, those insane creations that some of the best storytellers in the world have created and have that start to seep into my own work and start to yeah. seep into whatever it is that we're creating. Mm -hmm. And I know you were talking about this with me earlier off mic, mm -hmm. but you were saying, am I crazy to be taking all of this nuts inspiration mm. from these insane cinematic masterpieces and putting them into YouTube videos. Yeah, you've hit something that I talked to you about off camera and I think something that I wanted to be honest about right now. I look at these movies, some of the best movies ever made and I and also been growing up with some of these movies and using them as inspiration and bottom line, that's the reason why I wanted to be a filmmaker. I want to be doing what Christopher Nolan is doing. Is what to do with Chris, Quentin Tarantino. What I wanted to make my own A24 movie or whatever. And then I had all of that ability and mind and creativity. And then my career ended up being on YouTube. Yeah. And I think there has been a lot of moments where I have been wanting that desire to be a, a fantastic overall filmmaker and not just on YouTube. And I've been using opportunities to try to... Uh, quench that desire. Recently, me and Logan released a video of him buying a, a Pikachu Illustrator PSA 10, which is the most expensive Pokemon card in the world. Normally, some editors probably would, that's Pokemon, let's make this silly. Yeah. I would know, I'm going to make this the most overly dramatic thing as possible because I wanted to make a really engaging short film. Yeah. I didn't see this as a YouTube video. I saw this as a short film. Yeah. And so that's exactly what I did. How yeah. can I make this the most exciting piece of content ever made? How can I use storytelling techniques and do this? How can I make you care? And then I started doing a breakdown. I filmed my own breakdown. I spent two and a half days writing the script and I've spent the past five days editing this breakdown. Yeah. And I had this weird moment where I'm thinking, this is the most pretentious bullshit <laughs> ever. I'm talking about the peaks and valleys and the pit of despair and how, how can I get you as an audience to climb out of the pit of despair? And here's how I use the music to make you cry. And I'm like, Hayden, get it out of your own ass. <laughs> and I actually like, I say that in jest, but also I had this moment of concern of like, I'm making a YouTube video. Yeah. Why am I overthinking this? Yeah. And I'm getting a little bit confused because why am I treating this as if this is something I want you to watch in a cinema, but it's actually what people want to watch on their phone? That's such a fascinating question. I think that's why we're talking about it. 
because YouTube as a platform is it's it's never been that thing that all the film school nerds want. You mm. know, that's not their dream. They're not like I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a YouTuber. And I think that's what makes you different. Mm. And I think that is why you're doing so much to advance creators on that platform. Mm. So I just want to like take a moment and encourage you in this because Thank you. you are breaking ground and that little streamy award over there is you know proof of that thank you <laughs> okay so you're you're doing some amazing stuff and you are breaking ground where the platform of youtube needs to go you've said this before you know disney plus netflix and youtube they're all competing mm -hmm. for the exact same thing mm -hmm. as people wanting to watch content you know you can watch obi-wan on disney plus or you could head over to youtube and watch a freaking dope breakdown mm -hmm. on a logan paul YouTube video. Mm -hmm. This is insane. I can actually get inside of his brain mm -hmm. and figure out why he's making those choices and how he's pulling from the best stories all over the world from any time period and funneling all of that into a piece of content. And I think the amount of effort that you're putting into every single piece of content that you're releasing and that you're creating is going to go miles beyond what you can even ask or imagine mm -hmm. because the people are going to see that effort. Yeah. It's going to come through. You're not just twiddling your thumbs, wasting your time. You're actually, you know, putting so much thought into each and every one of these things. I do see YouTube in the same way uh, as people would view Disney Plus or yep. Disney as, as yep. a platform itself. I think yep. I look at some of the biggest critics on the platform as the same way I would Christopher Nolan or some of the other best directors today. I see them in the same light. And I think I've always have taken that YouTube, YouTube industry or the web content industry as seriously as people would take Hollywood. But that's the conflict because it's like, I feel like I'm unique in that perspective. I feel like I'm a bit unique in that attitude. Yeah. But I think maybe that is also the main reason why I have chosen to stick to YouTube and over editing or at least doing my best to prove that YouTube has a value that I see it as. Yeah. Part of me is I'm wanting to encourage creators to start thinking as you would making an A24 film. I want them to think as the same way as you would a Marvel film. You are allowed to think as big and you're allowed to overthink your content creation as much as they overthink in making those A24 and Hollywood movies. Yeah. I want to encourage that attitude. And I feel like we're not quite there yet, but if I can be the one to potentially help encourage that type of style of filmmaking and that style of thought, yeah. I've seen its growth significantly fast and to an extent yeah. the progression and the trajectory has been parallel to how the film industry has developed. We are now entering a phase where creators are building film lots. If you want to know where YouTube is going, look at the history of the film industry. And that is where I would imagine you could predict what's going to happen next. So much so that I think I should look into the history so I can start predicting, anticipating, and start working towards that direction. Dude, when you find out, <laughs> let me know. We're going to be on it, baby. Yeah, so we can then start making those billions of dollars straight away. I don't know. I think a fair question to ask when we're just thinking about where it could end up or what people prefer is what do you go to YouTube for and what do you go to different platforms for? So I've heard that so many people go to YouTube, at least that are our age, like solely to learn things. Like mm. they go to it for educational content. And if you want to be entertained or if you want to find a good story, you're going to go somewhere else. I think it's really, really fascinating because everything is developing their own niche. Yeah. And I don't think they're going to end up being the same thing mm. because then why would you have three of the same thing? People have viewing habits and the design of the platform dictates what your viewing habits are. The best way of explaining it is on TikTok. Do you ever go on TikTok with an intent? No, you waste time on TikTok. Yeah. You go, okay, I've got five minutes. Yep. I'll go watch a couple of TikToks. But then part of its design is you suddenly end up spending on two hours on it. When you go onto Netflix, to an extent, there is an intent. Yep. I will watch a movie. Yep. I will watch a TV show for three, four hours. Yep. I will do this. And you've sat down and you commit to it. Yep. YouTube is the mix of both, mm -hmm. where sometimes you go on YouTube with no intent and sometimes you go on YouTube with the intent of yeah. I will spend X time on this. And I think that is beautiful, but also a curse. Yeah. But the biggest problem with YouTube as, and as a design is that it knows that you can leave at any time. You're watching it on your laptop and maybe even on your phone and it's already advertised to you seven to 10 to 20 different videos that you can switch to next. So much so TikTok has the same thing. I'm bored, swipe. I'm bored, swipe. If you watch something on Netflix, you're committed. It, it doesn't matter if that seems boring, you're watching it. Yeah. And then with YouTube, the biggest problem is if you're watching this 30, 40 minute documentary and it slows down and, you have, and you're seeing all of these videos being advertised to you, you can either click on one of those 
Or if you're watching it on your desktop, you then get your phone out and you go on TikTok while you're on a YouTube session. So much so you probably even do the same thing on Netflix, but you still come back to Netflix. Mm-hmm. And like, this shit. <laughs> <laughs> you let me do, you let me, you let me on this round. I've rehearsed this round. I don't like that yeah. on YouTube that you have the potential or it encourages you to stop watching. And I want that with Netflix where it designs it that you are, when you watch a TV show, you're committed. Yeah. And so like, I would even love the idea of like you click on a YouTube video and that's the only thing that you see. You don't see recommended videos or anything like that. Or us as creators, since we still need to improve, we're not as good as Netflix yet. I think us need to be improving on our storytelling and our production quality and our style. We need to be able to advertise to our viewers, hey, please don't leave me. It's, hey, let me give you a good reason to stay. Exactly. We assume our audiences, as soon as they click on our video, they want to find the first reason to click off. Mm -hmm. We need to change our relationship and start trusting our audiences more in the same way Netflix trusts their audience. Yeah. And I think if we can start encouraging and relaying that message, I think audiences would without realizing change their viewing habits to mm-hmm. our content mm-hmm. and treat it in the same way as you would a Netflix session. And that's what I want on YouTube. That sounds like a good, too good to be true scenario. I think, yeah. I think the reason that people have that, you know, the desire to click off or the desire to go somewhere they sell is number one, because yeah, there mm. are options that are presented to them, but also YouTube doesn't have the reputation of, hey, we're every single thing that you click on is super high quality content that because has been made. Because everyone can post on YouTube. Because everyone can post on YouTube. Yes. So the nature of it just completely removes trust from the audience. And yeah. so the top creators, even the top creators have to be like, frick, don't leave because I know you have this other thing that is being recommended to you. Yeah. But because everyone can post. There's so much crap content out there. Yeah. And so that's just the nature of the and platform. TikTok is the doubled embodiment of that. Anyone and everyone can be famous on TikTok for one day. And, but that then means there's a lot of you got to sift through. Yep. That then also, again, dictates your viewing habits. And so I think the same thing for YouTube where the most beautiful thing about YouTube is that anyone can be a YouTuber, but it also seems to be a bit of a curse. It is. It's almost like you have to graduate from YouTube into a platform where you know, the audience trusts it. And I don't think that exists. And I don't think that can exist. Yeah. I would love to be proven wrong because I would love that as well. But just my gut feeling tells me that 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 might not work. I don't know. I feel like you could reach into a point where, you know, Ryan Trahan all of a mm. sudden is, you know, a good enough of a filmmaker to somebody will give him like a TV deal or something. I don't want to knock it off that it's impossible because it's Uncharted. And I would like to imagine that someone can potentially figure that out. I would love to be the person who potentially figures that out myself. I think you're well on the way. And I think mm. the the insecurity that you're feeling about spending, you know, a week or so to make a YouTube video and talking about it in such a pretentious light, I think that is honestly the way that you get there. Mm. You know, you ha- somebody has to be the trailblazer, has to be the pioneer to say, hey, this is how they do it. And this is yeah. how they make incredible stories that, you know, like these ones yeah. that we'll think about and remember for months on end. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we do that on YouTube so people keep coming back? And how do you, you gain more trust from your audience? Yeah. And that's, I think that's, that's what you're doing. I want to be able to relay to audiences that I can trust them. I also want to feel like I've got permission to overthink the way that I do when I make these YouTube videos. That's, that's what you're about. Yeah. That's what Hayden is about. So you have to do it. I but think that's what makes you you. That feels really nice. Thank you. I needed that encouragement. Oh yeah, yeah. Dude. The biggest problems with moments like this when you do ever think is the insecurities as a creative. And so I yeah. appreciate you telling me that everything's going to be okay. Dude, everything's going to be okay. You, the, the amount of times that I've just had existential creator crises is like every week. An existential so, creator crisis. An existential <laughs> creator crisis. It happens all the time. I think that's part of the process. It really is. Guys, I think that's it. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you listening to my uh, problems and our opinions. And I think our goal is to, well, let's get back into watching pretentious films. Thank you guys for watching. Bye. Bye.